Welcome back and good afternoon this time. I'm, uh, I'm back to give another lecture on section 3.2 now. This one's on polynomial functions. Last time we looked at quadratics. This time we'll be looking at just polynomials in general. Uh, we looked at some of the, some of the characteristics of quadratics uh, last time, things like maxima, minima, vertex, line of symmetry. Um, we looked at two forms of them, the standard form and the vertex form. This time with polynomials, we'll be looking at really just the standard form for polynomials. There's, as far as I know, there's no vertex form for your uh, arbitrary polynomial functions. There, there's the standard form, and that's kind of it. You can, uh, in certain cases, factor the entire polynomial, which we'll see in some examples. Uh, and I guess maybe that might be a different form of the polynomial, um, but it's it's not it's not called anything except for the factored form. Uh, usually, you work with standard forms in polynomials. So let's get started with that, and we will see where where it leads. So we're looking at polynomial functions. Uh, polynomials again. You take a bunch of coefficients uh, and you multiply them by a power of x. Usually, the the x power is the subscript, it's the label for the number that's multiplied by that. So a sub n, just a number, and it's the number that's multiplied by x to the n, n is the power of n. So a sub n minus 1 is the number that's multiplied by the x, which is to the n minus 1th power. So this is the standard form for a polynomial. But as I said in the last lecture, we usually don't write this last x to the 0th power. We usually just write it as a sub 0. Um, this is a standard polynomial. Uh, this is nth degree. If a sub n is not equal to 0, if it is, well then we look at the next smallest power of x. Uh, and we see that they're biggest over here, and they decrease going to the right. So if if a sub n is zero, well then it might be an n minus one degree if a sub n minus one is not zero. That's a way of determining the degree. You just look at the highest power on the x, or the highest power on the variable. Again, each of these numbers that are multiplied by the variables, they're called coefficients. So a sub zero, a sub 1 dot 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 a sub n are real numbers. Called coefficients. A sub n has a special name. It is the leading coefficient. And as we'll see later today, it is the number which dictates the end behavior, uh, in large part, the end behavior of the polynomial. So a sub n is the leading coefficient. We say leading because it's right in front. It's the first one here. It's the first number over here. Um, when this is arranged in decreasing degree. so. It's just the one in the lead. The one over here on the far right, a sub 0, this is called the constant coefficient. Um, I, I guess that's a term. Um, sometimes just the constant. So I'll put this in parentheses. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Leading term, yeah, sure. So we remember in polynomials that the things that are added together are called terms. So this, this a sub n times x to the n, that's a term. This is a term, dot, dot, dot. This is a term. And then a sub 0 is by itself a term. It's a constant term. It doesn't have a variable. It's a constant term. Everything else is a variable term. Um, and that's, for the most part, the vocabulary that we're looking at here. So let's look at just a quick example. 
5x to the fourth plus 3x to the third minus 2x plus 1. Okay, so this is a fourth degree polynomial. That's the highest degree. It's written in standard form, meaning I've got the highest term, highest degree term here, the next highest, the next highest, the next highest. So it's written in decreasing degree, which is great. It's fourth degree. Um, there are four terms. You'll, you'll notice there's x to the second power missing. That's okay. There's essentially a plus zero x squared here. That's fine. A sub two is zero. That's okay. It's not a problem. Uh, the leading coefficient is five. I think I said the constant coefficient, or constant is one, and I think I already said degree is four too. So just just some information and uh, an example of using those terminologies for you. So the next thing that we're going to look at is, as I said earlier, it's it's dictated by two things. The next thing we're looking at is the end behavior of a polynomial function. End behavior. And this is dictated by the two things. One of them I pointed out already. It's the leading coefficient and the degree. So end behavior. What is it? The end behavior of a polynomial is how this, how a given rule behaves or acts when inputs get very large and I can say either positively or negatively and I hope you understand my meaning. We either get closer and closer, we, get, we either get larger and larger and larger in terms of positive numbers or we get very, very big, but in the negative direction, right? So we either go on the real number line out this way towards positive infinity, or we go in the other direction towards negative infinity with our inputs. We, we plug in bigger and bigger things or more and more negative things, and we look and see what our function does. Some functions have a very patterned end behavior. Some don't have a very patterned end behavior. Polynomials do have a very nice pattern to their end behavior. And two things help you determine what they are. As I said, the leading coefficient and the degree of the leading term. They determine a polynomial's end behavior. We could talk about other functions and, and then we wouldn't be able to make conclusions like this. But for polynomials in particular, the end behavior or how a polynomial or rule behaves when inputs get very large, uh, for polynomials, it's just that leading coefficient and that leading term's degree that determine the end behavior. Uh, there could be strange things happening, you know, if for small inputs or for a certain range within the inputs. But overall, there's a big pattern to be seen with polynomials just based on the leading coefficient and the degree. So here they are. So if the degree of the leading term is even, or if the degree of the leading term is odd. We have two situations, things that we've seen before. So we'll, we'll kind of look at some examples. We know that x squared looks like this. This is a good example, a good uh, representative of what's happening here. It starts in the top left, comes down, and goes up to the top right. It's a good example of an even degree polynomial. Uh, what about x to the fourth? 
Well, I've given that as an example too, and it looks more or less the same, but it is a little bit flatter here at the bottom. It's steeper on the sides, but it's flatter on the bottom. And we could keep showing these things, and they would just have more and more of that property. They're flatter towards the bottom, but steeper on the, edge, on the edges. So what happens if the degree of the leading term is even? Well, it, it depends next on one thing. It's the sign of the leading coefficient. If it's positive or negative, that determines the end behavior. So in these examples that I've got drawn right now, you can see that the end behavior is these things climb higher and higher and higher and higher. Right? The, the, the graphs would just keep continuing up higher and higher. There'd, there'd be no end to it. So for an even degree, positive coefficient polynomial, so the positive leading, ter leading coefficient, the end behavior is that the output just climbs to positive infinity. If we have a negative leading coefficient, what happens to these graphs is they just flip over. Negative x squared. Negative x to the fourth. So what happens to the end behavior? Well, they go further and further down. They fall further and further towards negative infinity. There's nothing fishy happening with these basic examples. They, this is exactly what they do. They continue going up or they continue going down depending on that leading coefficient sign. So I'll summarize this. For even coefficients here, for even, sorry, for even uh, degrees, if the leading coefficient is positive, and d, the degree, is even, then, and here's how I'm gonna, gonna write this, as x goes to infinity. What this means is as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in the positive direction, then the polynomial, I'm gonna say p of x, goes to, and let's look at our examples, it's going to go to positive infinity too. Okay, so that's one of the end behaviors, and we can see it in this branch here, and we can see it in this branch here. As we plug in bigger and bigger x values, this function is just going to climb up higher. And as x goes to negative infinity. In other words, our input becomes more and more negative. So we're on this, in this first example, if we start at zero and we start plugging in numbers that are smaller and smaller and smaller, and just further and further down that line, what happens if we have a positive leading coefficient and an even degree, ter uh, degree term? Uh, is it just keeps going in the same direction as we had before? our polynomial's height just keeps climbing. So if you have an even degree leading term and a leading coefficient that is positive, your function just climbs to infinity. It might have some wiggles in between, but as x gets really big or really small in the negative direction, your function just keeps growing. Okay, now we can we can flip some things around here and so I'm going to do that with colors. So if we have a less than zero, if we have a negative leading coefficient with an even degree, what happens is these both go to negative infinity and we can see that in the examples. So what I'm telling you here is actually, you know, something that we've discovered just looking at x squared and x to the fourth. But what's what's kind of astounding, maybe maybe confusing, is that it doesn't matter uh, what polynomial we have, so long as the leading coefficient is positive and the degree is even. This is the end behavior. The pattern is 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 that universal amongst the polynomials. 
I could write down any polynomial. Uh, negative 28x to the 17th minus 6x to the 16th plus 2. Well, what's the end behavior of this polynomial? We can follow the exact rule that we've written up here, even though this is not, uh, I, I just noticed now I haven't done the odds yet, so let me change this to 18. Uh, we can apply the same rule, even though this isn't just an x squared or an x to the fourth. It's a big, long sum of terms. We can still apply the same rule, and the general reason why is when x gets really big, the difference between x to the 18th and x to the 16th is huge. x is much, much bigger than x. x to the 18th is much, much bigger than x to the 16th when you plug in a huge number. Um, right? You could think of like plugging in 10, and x to the 18th is already 100 times bigger than x to the 16th. So you plug in something like a million and you're talking about a very, very, very big difference between these two terms. So the only thing that matters is the sign of that leading coefficient and the degrees parity, even or odd. So this one has n behavior as x goes to infinity or negative infinity. So I can write them both succinctly as one here because we've realized it doesn't matter for even degree polynomials. Um, as x goes to positive or negative infinity, the rule above says, because this is negative, that the polynomial itself goes to negative infinity. The graph would look something like this. It'd come up, maybe it would have a wiggle in there, but it's eventually going to come back down. And as we plug in more negative things, or more positive things, the bigger that it is, the smaller it is, the further we go down to negative infinity on both sides. So this is the rule for even, even leading degree uh, and even leading coefficient for n behavior. In the odd situation, things get a little bit stranger, but we're going to do the same sort of analysis of n behavior using a, some example functions. So if a sub n is positive again, and d, the degree, is odd, then as x goes to positive infinity, as x goes to negative infinity, polynomial the polynomial goes to what? So let's let's take a quick example of this. Uh, this is if the degree is odd, then we have these two things happening. So as our typical example, we'll look at x cubed, which goes like this. It does have a wiggle in there little bit of one. And we could also plot x to the fifth. It's going to be a little bit of a flatter curve here in the middle, but it's going to be steeper on the edges. There's a pretty general trend here. They all look the same with a little bit of, you know, different slopes in different places. If we have an odd degree, and a positive leading coefficient like these, no matter what polynomial we have, so long as that leading term has an odd degree and a positive leading coefficient, they all are going to act like this. Because eventually as x gets huge, the difference between, like I said before, x to the fifth and x to the fourth, it's huge. Right? If I plug in a million here, x to the fifth is a million times bigger than x to the fourth. 
So this is the only term that really matters eventually. It's the only thing that really affects what happens when the function has huge inputs or very small inputs in the negative direction, right? So that means these parent functions act as our, our guides and they both say the same thing. As you go more and more in the positive direction, what does our function do? It climbs up higher and higher. And as you go more and more and more in the negative direction, what happens to our function? It, it falls further and further down. Okay? And that's, that's it for polynomials and, and, and behavior. I could give you now any polynomial and say, uh, let's just pick one. Here's, here's one from the book. Negative 2x to the fourth plus 5x cubed minus 7. So let's, let's list the end behavior. As x goes to positive infinity, as x goes to negative infinity, as it gets bigger and bigger or smaller and smaller, what does this function do? We'll call it f of x. Then we'll say f goes to, well, we've got a negative leading coefficient, and the leading term has degree 4. So the general shape is uh, upside down parabola type thing. So it's going to go down further and further and further on both sides. Just because it's an even function here, not an even function necessarily, just because it's an even leading term. If I change this at all, negative 2x to the fifth plus x to the fourth minus 8. We'll call this one our new function. As x goes to infinity, or negative infinity, what happens? Well, I actually didn't go through this case before. We don't really need to, uh, you know, we can think about this on the fly. Remember, an odd degree with a positive coefficient looks like this. So what does the negative here mean? This negative flips it. So this new one looks like this in red. Okay, so our function with a positive 2 times x to the fifth would look like this black curve, which I'm going to erase now. The negative just flips it over horizontally, right? Flips it across the x-axis. So this is what we're dealing with now, this red curve. So as we go further and further in this direction, our function goes lower and lower. That is, it goes down to negative infinity. And as we go further and further to the left, our function goes further and further up. So this is the end behavior of this function. Okay. So it's not terribly difficult. You're just looking at the leading term, at the degree, whether it's even or odd, and then at the leading coefficients, sign, whether it's positive or negative. And that's how you can determine the end behavior of any polynomial, any. Okay, so we'll do more examples like that on Wednesday. But um, the next thing we're going to look at is uh, some properties of the real zeros of a polynomial. Kind of hinted at, hinted at this earlier. Um, I said there's there's really just one form, I guess. There's the standard form of polynomials. But you could factor polynomials. Uh, you can factor them all. Uh, but uh, it might not be super nice to factor them. So we'll, we'll stick with real zeros for now. We're not going to get into complex zeros. Um, but you could, for any polynomial, list out all of its zeros. And that is equivalent to saying a few different things. So first thing is I'm just going to list some of these things out. So C, we're going to say C, a number C, is a zero of a polynomial P. So P is the name of my polynomial, and C is a number that when you plug it in for the variable for poly the polynomial, you get zero out. Okay? So I'll, I'll write that explicitly here. P of C is 0. 
So that's what this first sentence means. Now there are some there are some equivalent things that things that mean the same thing here. And I see now I've actually by explicitly writing this out, x equals c is a solution to p of x equals 0. The first one is like the vocabulary. Like number one, c is a 0 of a polynomial p. Uh, that's kind of like the vocabulary sentence that we're using here. When you say a number is a 0, usually what you mean is number 2, or what I wrote in red. When you plug it in for x, you get 0 out. So those two things, that first sentence and the second one, those are equivalent. Here's another equivalent one. Number three, if you were to try and factor your polynomial, like you've done for quadratics, if you're trying to factor it out, right, so that a big product of factors multiplies to give you the original thing. Uh, for number three here, if c is a zero of a polynomial, then this is true. x minus c is a factor of p. So that's also an interesting thing. What this tells you is if you know all of the zeros, every single one of a polynomial, then you can factor it very easily. You just multiply together x minus the zero for every single zero. You just you take one of each of those for every single zero and you multiply them all together and you've got your polynomial for the most part. It's going to be pretty close. There might be uh, there might be some some constant multiplications uh, that need to correct it, but for the most part, that's it. Additionally, there's one more thing that's equivalent. C is an x-intercept of p. So if you graphed p and then you found all of the places on the x-axis that your graph crosses uh, those values, those are all zeros for your polynomial. And that's because the x-axis is at a height of y equals zero. So it's very much like this, right? Okay, so these four things, these are all equivalent. If you have a zero of a polynomial, well then what you know is you can plug it into your polynomial and get zero. You also know that x minus the zero is a factor. You also know that your graph crosses the x-axis at that x at that zero value. Okay, so like these are these are really kind of kind of important things to be able to translate between real quickly because uh, these these things all mean the same thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, here we go. The next thing that we've got here feels like today we're kind of just jumping from topic to topic. I agree. Uh, polynomials are a complicated thing. Your book uh, organizes these in a, in a way that just tells you a lot about polynomials. Um, so you learned about end behavior of polynomials. You've learned about leading coefficients and leading degrees. You've learned about uh, zeros and some equivalent things about the zeros of polynomials. And now you're going to learn about a, a, a theorem, something about polynomials. And it's called the intermediate value theorem. Um, for those of you that wish to continue on in math, this is such a hugely important theorem. Uh, you're going to use it for as long as you do math. I, I, I claim that. You're going to use it for as long as you do math. So it, th this is the statement of it in pictures. So if we've got a polynomial uh, and you've got a point on your graph, so here's A, you plug it in and this is P of A right down here. If you've got a polynomial where you plug in an A and you plug in a different one, B, and if they have opposite signs, right, one's above the x-axis, one's below the x-axis, then there is some some c, some value in between a and b, there has to be, such that 
when you plug in C, you get zero. In other words, if you tried to connect these using the rule described by the polynomial, you might have some wiggles. You might even dip down below again the x-axis. But if you can find two different inputs for a polynomial, one of them giving you a positive output and one of them giving you a negative output, then you're guaranteed to have at least one value in between those two inputs where you get a zero. So you can think about factoring now, for, for example. If you can find these two inputs that give you a positive and a negative output, you're guaranteeing that you found a zero in between, which means you're guaranteeing that you know a factor for your polynomial has, you know, it's somewhere in between, <laughs> somewhere in between A and B. So that X minus C is a factor and C is somewhere in between A and B. So this gives you a method to approximately factor any polynomial. Additionally, this also gives you ways to narrow in on zeros. If you find A and B such that one's positive and one's negative in the outputs, you change one of them. You know, you can move B to the left and eventually you move it more and more, you're gonna get two negative outputs. Right? And the sign of P of B is gonna change. It's gonna be positive and then negative and then positive and then negative you can narrow in on where those zeros are by using test points. So this is a really, really important thing. Um, I don't want to erase this, so I'll just move it down. But I'm going to write out now <clears throat> the intermediate value theorem. So if P is a polynomial and P of A and P of B have opposite signs. One's positive, one's negative. It doesn't matter which one is which. They just have to be opposite. Then there exists some C inside this interval A to B. Okay, in fact, I could be more explicit here. It's not A and it's not B if they're both either positive or negative, where P of C equals zero. That's the intermediate value theorem. There exists at least one. There could be multiples, but at least one. Okay, so that's the words of what I just drew here. I hope that understand, helps you understand uh, what it's saying there. Okay, now the last thing that I need to talk about is how to uh, how to graph these things just in general. So how to graph polynomial if you know its factors and I'm going to put in parentheses, with multiplicities. I'll explain that next. Okay. So if you could factor a polynomial entirely, I don't know, I'll put x minus z here. 26 factors. One of them is really confusing, x minus x. <laughs> so if you know every single factor, uh, it's entirely possible that some of these factors are the same. It's entirely possible. I mean, if I know a polynomial that has two zeros and both of them are zero, what do I get? I get x squared. <gasps> We've got two zeros and they're both zero. Okay, what about what about 
a polynomial with something that's not zero. It's got two factors, they're both negative, or they're both one, right? What does this turn into? Well, that's x squared minus 2x plus 1. If you were to factor this, you would find that it has two factors, x minus 1, which means it has two zeros, and they're both 1. That's what we call multiplicity. If you count out how many times a, s a certain factor is repeated, that's the multiplicity. So uh, here's how you graph things if uh, you know the multiplicities of, of the zeros. So let's write it out. p of x equals x minus uh, x minus a I'm going to write n times x minus b and I'll write uh, maybe I'll write n sub a so it's a number a whole number so it's n sub b and it just keeps going right if you could factor a polynomial out like this how do you graph it well it turns out you can look locally so you can look at the specific values for A and look at the specific values for B and you list all of these zeros out on the real number line and based solely on a couple things, namely those things and whether they're even or odd, you know exactly what's gonna happen. And so I think the best way to do this is to, is to really get some examples under your belts because I know this is gonna get confusing so instead of listing you the theory now, we're going to get some examples under our belts, and you'll get more of this on Wednesday too. But I'll come back to the general case when I'm done with these examples. So uh, let's, let's figure this out with some examples. So let's suppose we've got this. I know it looks confusing, but uh, we're, we're just going we're just gonna to go with this, I think. Um, so it's going to be x squared minus 2x plus 1. It's that same 1. We know this factors into x minus 1 squared. What does the graph of this thing look like? Well, If we were to plot this, it would look exactly like this. Okay, This is x squared, but it's been shifted to the right by one unit. at x equals 1, this thing comes down and it touches the x-axis and bounces up. Another one that we can look at, which is very similar, is x minus 1 cubed. Another one that we can look at, which is very similar, is this, x minus 1 to the fourth. I'm going to plot that last one right on top of this one. It looks like this. At x equals 1, it has a 0. It starts up high, comes down, touches the x-axis at that one place, and then pops back up. What about x minus 1 cubed? Well, we know at 1, it's at 0. What does it do? In other places, though, it does this. Comes up from the bottom, crosses through, and then keeps going. If I kept doing more and more of these, you would recognize something. If this degree is even, the effect is at the x-axis, the graph comes down and sort of bounces right off and goes back up. It doesn't go through. In the case where it's an odd power, it goes through the x-axis. Okay, so this gives you a way, along with what I said here earlier, if you list out those zeros on the x-axis, this gives you a way of determining, you know, if Na is even, it gives you a way of determining, you know, does it look like this or does it look like this? Does it come down from above and bounce off? Does it come down from below and bounce off? 
or in the case that n b, the multiplicity of this zero b is odd, you know, does it come down from below and cross through like this? Or does it come down from above, cross through, and then keep going down? The general thing is actually exactly what we saw here, where the even multiplicities of a specific zero mean that the graph bounces off the axis. The odd multiplicity of a specific zero means that the graph goes through the x-axis. So this gives you a way of zero by zero, looking at the multiplicities, it gives you a way of going zero by zero and graphing in part your entire function. So what we're going to do next is we are going to Next we're going to graph a, it's going to be a, a complicated one, but here's what it's going to be. We're going to graph this one. It's going to be p of x equals x to the fourth, x minus two cubed, x plus one squared. We're going to do this by looking at every single zero and looking at the multiplicities and then determining whether it goes through or whether it bounces off. So when we graph something like this, where there's multiple factors, uh, I think it really pays to first look at a number line and place those zeros on that number line. So let's suppose this is our x-axis and put our y-axis here. Then what we'll do is we'll identify those zeros. So this first factor here x to the fourth says that we've got a factor which which indicates a zero of literally zero. So if we plugged in zero there, we would get that the whole thing is a product of zero. So that is itself, this indicates zero is a zero. And it has multiplicity four. Okay, so now at this point we don't know whether this the, the graph comes down from above like this and bounces off, or if it comes from below and bounces off. It's one of these two. So maybe what I'll do is I will graph them both. It's either this or it's this, and then we'll erase the right one. Let me do that, not in a dotted line, in a different color. So it's one of these two. A quick way to check is to pick a number close to zero. So maybe pick one and test what you get. If it's positive, well then it's the top graph. If it's negative, then it's the bottom graph. That's a really quick way to check. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm not going to do that at this very moment. Okay, then let's locate our other zeros. This factor says that two is a zero and it has multiplicity three. So either our graph continues like this red one, going up and through, going through that, or it's like this gray one, comes down and crosses through there like that, okay? It's one of those two. We don't know which one it is, uh, but it can quickly be identified by testing a point, like for example, one. That multiplicity three, though, means uh, that our graph is going to go through the x-axis at that zero. And then the last one to identify is <coughs> negative one. That comes from this factor. So this is negative one. And the evenness of this multiplicity says that our graph comes either down and touches, comes down and touches, uh, there and then bounces back up, or it comes up, touches, and then comes back down. So I, I you know, this this first drawing of it kind of was a little bit smashed together. Um, I'll come back and give a better graph once we determine which which curve it is, um, and then I'll I'll give a a, a really precise drawing of it um, after the fact. So so let's just take a test point and figure this out, okay? Let's pick the 
point one. Right? If we pick the point one, we're going to get one times negative one cubed times two squared. Is that positive or negative? It's negative, right? It's negative four, which means we're on this red curve, which means this red curve, if I were to sort of continue it here and continue it here on the left, looks pretty close to what the actual curve is. It has the essential ingredients, if you will. It has the overall shape, if you will. Uh, how could we determine this in another way without using a test point? Well, you could look at the leading term. Now, in this form, there is no leading term, right? This is a factored form. But what if, what if we first just multiplied out just a little bit? So this x to the fourth is multiplied by this x minus two. Let's forget the minus two for a second. So then it turns just into x times, or x cubed, right? So if we, if we more or less forgot that negative two was there, this would be close to x to the fourth times x cubed. And if we did the same thing with that last factor, we'd have, we'd have an x squared if we forgot that one was there. And in fact, if you were to multiply this out, this would be one of the terms that you'd have, but then you'd have other terms as well. Okay, so what we're doing isn't too far off base. Well, this is x to the five plus four, x to the ninth power. That's an odd power. And all of those x's had positive signs in front of them. None of them were negative. So this is an x to the ninth, which, because it's odd, has this general shape. If this is the x and y axis, this is x to the ninth there. So our graph here comes up, bounces off this zero, comes down, does something, comes back up to zero at zero, drops down again, comes back up and goes through that zero. Okay, so now let me give a, a more careful graph of this. So we know it comes up from here, bounces off, and then it's gonna come up, go down rather, it's not gonna go through because of the even multiplicity. It's gonna come down and then bounce again off of zero. Then it's gonna come down a little bit to negative four, we found that out at one. And then it's actually gonna come back up like this. So there we have it. This is my approximate graph for what this curve looks like. This, this graph, I don't know exactly what it is yet. I'm gonna show that in a second. But this parabola, sorry, not this parabola, this curve, I suspect looks something like this. So I'm gonna pause this, I'm gonna graph it on a graphing utility, and I'll resume the video once I've got that so that you can see sort of a comparison of what we've got. All right, so I've unpaused the recording now and I've graphed the actual function, and this is what it looks like. And so if you compare this to what we just graphed, right there, take a look at how close we were. So this is, again, this is not a perfect graph, but did we test any points? Did we make a table of any points? <laughs> no. We simply plotted those zeros on the x-axis. So I guess we made a table there and we made a few points. And then we just used the multiplicities of the factors that we had to give us the overall behavior locally. So that means close to those zeros. And we came up with this graph, and in comparison, here's the real one. So I can tell right now our scale was off, right? Our scale was not quite right, but this was a pretty ad hoc graph. And flipping back and forth between these two, you know, I'd say this is, this is pretty darn close. Um, so our point uh, where we tested that test point was one. We got negative four, and that actually identified for us what happens in all of these intervals. 
right? And if you zoomed out, you can really see the behavior of x to the ninth. Oops. x to the ninth, right? It's that green curve now. You can, you can really just see that it, it does kind of have that overall behavior of x to the ninth of starting way down here in the left and going way down, way up there to the right with a few wiggles in between, which we correctly identified just by looking at the multiplicities. So I guess to, to conclude here, this is, this is a huge video about, about polynomials just in general and talking about what it means for something to be a zero or talking about the intermediate value theorem. So that's, and that's a big one. Um, and talking about other things for polynomials too. Uh, lots of new stuff. I know this is a, a, one of the more confusing sections for the year. So on Wednesday, we're gonna go through lots of examples and we're gonna, we're gonna spend some time on this, figuring out some more things uh, about this. Hopefully you'll get a good sense uh, of what these techniques can be used for. Um, but in reality, a lot of this is gonna come down to your own studies and your own practice for these things. Um, I don't have enough time to go through bunches and bunches of examples with you. So we're gonna get what we get through and you'll just have to ask questions if you have them. So please do not hesitate to email me if you have questions on the homework. Please do not hesitate to uh, ask me questions during office hours if you have the time. Uh, I can set up an office hours time for you that's different than the normal time. Um, whatever, whatever we can do, whatever I can do to help you understand this, this difficult topic of polynomials and their, their general properties, um, let's get it sorted so that I can help you as best as, best as I can and, and in a way that you need. So I hope to talk to you soon. Uh, I hope this helps. I know it's a longer video, but this is a more difficult topic. And, uh, and so, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, don't forget about the quizzes coming up, the homework coming up, and the test next week. So I'll see you next time. And until then, take it easy.